Happy Sabbath! How are you all? I hope you had a blessed week. Tonight, I continue to pray to the Lord that He will continue to be with you and that you feel His presence and that you feel His love. Tonight, we're going to describe in some detail the ministry of Ellen Harmon. Ellen Harmon is Ellen White's maiden name. And this ministry happened during the first critical year after the great disappointment in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. After the great disappointment, without proper leadership, a few of the believers thought they were following the instruction of God's word. But then they don't have a true understanding of what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And they became involved with something strange and, and, and some wild beliefs. So Ellen White called them the spiritualizer or the fanatics. Let me show you what she said. These men and women, wrote Ellen White, who was personally acquainted with some, were not bad, but they were deceived and deluded, she commented. In the past, they had been blessed with a consciousness that they have a knowledge of the truth, and they had accomplished much good. But now Satan was molding the work. So these were some of the people or believers that she dealt with during her early ministries. But let me give you more information about those who were called spiritualizer by her or fanatics. These people were from the group who didn't leave the Evan belief and were clinging to the confidence that prophecy had been fulfilled on October 22nd. Well, they found it hard to wait for more light. And soon they were swept away by the teaching that Jesus already came. And October 22nd was the spiritual coming of Jesus Christ. And so... They proclaimed this, uh, we are now in his kingdom. And so they created their own belief and activities according to this concept of the spiritual coming of Jesus Christ. And so this was under, it was under this circumstance that the 17 year old Ellen Harmon was sent as a messenger of God. So God told her, to go and share with the people the message that he had given to her. The beginning of share, her sharing was made in Portland, Maine, her hometown, right? And we also mentioned last week that Ellen White was intimidated initially by this huge responsibility. Therefore, a second vision was given to her and tell her that she really needs to share this vision even though she might encounter difficulties and trials. And the angel told her that God's grace would be sufficient for her. And so with this assurance in her heart, Ellen committed herself to the Lord and read to what he told her to do at whatever cost. And we also mentioned last week that Ellen encountered ridicules and disbelief, but there were many who were eyewitnesses while she was having her visions told others of their experience and testified that Alan's visions were from God. Now we're going to discuss some of Alan's experience during her initial ministry and counting, encountering different audience, different believers. And this was after the great disappointment and after her first visions. Alan had two married sisters living in Poland, Maine. Ellen lived in Portland. Her sister lived 30 miles north of her in Poland, Maine. About 30 miles north, I just mentioned. And so Mary, one of them was married to this man called Samuel Foss. Three months after the Great Disappointment in late January, 1845, Samuel Foss, that means Alan's brother-in-law, has some business to attend to in Portland. And so while he was 
in the city of Portland, he visited the Harmons family. And he told the Harmons that Mary, his wife, you know, which is Alan's sister, would like Alan to visit her. So Alan decided to go with her brother-in-law to Poland, Maine. She thought this was probably an opportunity provided by God for her to share her experience. January was a bitter, cold month. In spite of her feeble health, she made that 30-mile journey with her brother-in-law. And according to her biography, she was crouched at the bottom of the sleigh with a buffalo rope. Well, buffalo rope is a furry blanket made with cured buffalo hide. So she used this buffalo rope to cover her head. When she reached Poland, she learned that there's going to be a meeting of the Adventists at this little chapel on McGuire's Hill. And Mary invited Ellen to attend, so she consented. And at the meeting, she stood up to relate what God has shown her in vision. For five minutes, she spoke only in a whisper. Remember of her health issue, right? She was very weak. And then, miraculously, her voice became louder and clearer. And she was able to address the audience for the whole two hours. And this was the first occasion that she told of her first vision outside of Portland. So this is what she said. She said, in this meeting, the power of the Lord came upon me and on the people. And she further stated, when my message was ended, my voice was gone until I stood before the people again when the same singular restoration was repeated. I felt a constant assurance that I was doing the will of God and saw marked results attending my effort. That means that every time she stood up to speak, her voice become what? Louder and clearer. But once her presentation or her sharing session was over, she returned to her weak voice. The next morning in her sister's home, she met a young man called Hasten Foss. And we discovered that Hasten Foss was Samuel Foss, younger brother. And remember, Samuel Foss was Alan's brother-in-law, right? So Hasten Foss told Alan of his own story. He said that sometime before the first vision was given to Alan in December, the Lord God also had given just such a vision to him too. God told him that he was to tell others what God had revealed to him. However, at that time, he was still very bitter about the great disappointment. He felt that he had been deceived. He knew too under that climate after the great disappointment, there would be ridicule and scorn if anyone were to proclaim that they have a vision from God. So he refused to obey the many promptings of God's Holy Spirit. He refused that opportunity to share the vision. So the Lord came near to him in another vision, told him that if he refused to share the message of the vision, to the people, the Lord would reveal the vision to someone else, placing his spirit on the weakest of the weak. But Hasten Foss still felt that he could not bear that big responsibility and he could not face the disapproval of the people. So he told God that he would not do it. And then something very strange happened to him. A voice said, You have grieved away the Spirit of the Lord. So that frightened Hasten, horrified at his own stubbornness and rebellion. He told the Lord that now I am going to relate the vision 
So he called a meeting of the Adventists for that purpose. So when the people came together, he tried to remember his vision so he could tell them. But strangely, he could not remember any of it. Even with the most concentrated effort, he could not recall a word of it. So he cried out in distress in front of the audience. He said, it's gone from me. I can say nothing. And the spirit of the Lord has left me. Those who were present described the meeting as the most terrible meeting that they have ever attended. So at Ellen, sister's home, this was what Hazen Foss told Ellen. He also told her that although he did not go into the chapel where she spoke the night before, but she was standing outside the door and he heard every word that she has said. He told Ellen that what the Lord has shown to her had first been shown to him. But he said he was too proud. He couldn't reconcile to the disappointment and he complained in his heart against God and wished he was dead. Then he felt a strange feeling came over him that from that moment onward, he shall become one dead to spiritual things. He believed the visions had been taken from him and given to Alan. And so he advised Alan, do not refuse to obey God for it will be at the risk of your soul. I am a lost man. You are chosen of God. Be faithful in doing your work. And the crown I might have had, you will receive. This unusual experience made a permanent impression upon Alan. The commands of God's Spirit were not to be trifled with. After the few days at Poland in her sister's home, Ellen was back again in Portland. Convinced that she must follow what God had told her to do, she promised to go wherever if the Lord opened the way. And so soon after that, she received an invitation by a man called William Jordan and his sister Sarah to travel with them to Eastern Maine, Orrington. Let me show you a map of where it is at. And that she, she was invited to be there to share her vision to the Advent people over there. The Jordan's purpose of going there initially was for business, but they heard about Alan's vision, so they thought they would invite her to come along and share experience to the believers there. Also at the same time, they could return their borrowed horse back to James White. James White would eventually become Alan's husband, but at that time, Alan didn't know James White. They were going to travel quite a distance, 100 miles to Orrington by sleigh on the frozen Penobscot River. Can you see it? Look at how cold it is and the sleigh sitting in that sleigh for 100 miles. Well, little did Ellen realize what was before her. She had now taken up a position of confident trust in God. Financial resources for her journey did not concern her. Just where her itinerary might take her, she didn't know. As to the message that she should bear, she would depend totally on God. Alan had to deal with fanaticism that I explained earlier while she was in Orrington, Maine. She said she saw most of the brethren and sisters, and she warned them of their dangers. Some would rejoice that God had sent her, but there were others that refused to listen to her testimony as soon as they learned that her message was not in agreement with their belief. They said she was not from God and that she was from the world 
and that they must keep their own position to continue on this straight, plain, and glorious path. What they meant by glory was actually an emotional type of worship with shouting and hallooing. Hallooing is some kind of shouting that draws attention. It is some kind of a charismatic sort of a worship, but it's driven by emotion. The disappointment in 1844 had confused the minds of many, and they would not listen to explanation of the matter, unfortunately. But there were some who listened, though. They dare not deny that the Lord had been leading them. And these were Otis Nichols, which I'm going to mention him later, the Howlands and Hastings families, Joseph Bates, and their others. Um, and some of these individuals actually became the pioneers of the Adventist church. And this group of people was so glad that they could hear word of God that explained to them what they had just experienced in October 22nd, 1844. So as they listened to the explanation of the great disappointment, which was so bitter for them, they saw and they understood that God had indeed led them and they rejoiced in the truth. Unfortunately, this awakened the most bitter opposition on the part of those who deny God's leadership in the past experience. The fanatics and the spiritualizer, those who believed that Jesus had already come, Jesus had his spiritual coming in October 22, 1844. And this group, they were quite hostile. And do you know what they believe? They claimed that they were already sanctified and that they could not sin because they were already sealed and holy. And so all the impressions and beliefs were from the mind of God. Unfortunately, some of the sincere searching believers were deceived by this pretentious religious fanatics. But by the grace of God, Alan was there. So when Alan opened their eyes to the fruit of the truth, comparing to the fruit of falsehood from those fanatic and spiritualizer, they began to understand. And peace and joy came into their hearts. And they broke away from those who spread deceptions and lies. While well, Alan met James White at Orrington when Jordan returned the horse to him, Alan Harmon became acquainted with this young, sincere Adventist minister who firmly believed in the fulfillment of prophecy in the Adventist experience. You know, we just talked about fanaticism that Alan had encountered in the year after 1844. But this is not just a matter of history that we're talking about. According to the visions of Ellen White, that the history of the past will repeat as God's people will meet fanaticism again before the end of time. So we're studying these incidents not just studying history. It's a study as a warning to us too that these things will happen again before Jesus comes. So we must stay alert to know what is true and what is false. A few months later, in late winter and spring months of 1845, Alan Harmon was traveling almost constantly First, in eastern Maine that I just mentioned, Orrington, from late summer and through the winter 1845 and 1846, she spent a lot of time in Massachusetts. And there she stayed in the home of Otis Nicole family in Dorchester, just south of Boston. Remember I just mentioned about the Otis Nicole family? They were one of those family that believed that God was leading them 
even after the great disappointment. And prior to going to Dorchester, they met with the believers in Roxbury, which is a city west of Dorchester. This is just to tell you how many places she goes, not to just tell you all the places name, right? She going to tr she traveled from place to place, and with her weak health, but God has been strengthening her all this time. So in Ro Roxbury, there was a large group of people gathered in a meeting. She told them that they came from Maine and delivering a message from God to them. And this message is about a vision that God has shown her. So being a stranger to that town, she was at first received rather coolly. People were cold to her. But soon after Ellen began to relay her vision, the power of the Holy Spirit rested upon the group so that all who were present there were impressed that the message was from the Lord and that it was a light to the remnant and a present truth for them. So they all received it and rejoiced. And there was this pastor there called Pastor Haskin, one of the main leaders at that time, said that they had never experienced such spiritual revival since the Great Disappointment in 1844. So after the meeting in Roxbury, the next day, Alan then went to Dorchester, Otis Nichols' house. On April 6, 1846, she finally returned back to Portland, Maine. Although some people rejected Alan's message, but overall her message was well received because the Holy Spirit was there and people generally recognized that it was from God and many were touched and they felt fed spiritually and they felt comforted and strengthened in the faith. But then sadly, those who rejected her message soon drifted away from the faith and also quite sad that there were some initially receptive to her testimony and accepted that it was from God, but later on they rejected it. Perhaps they didn't let the faith take root. And these people later used by the enemy, Satan, and they call Alan's vision an unholy thing and that she was being mesmerized. So they were succumbed by the deception of Satan and became his pawn, according to Alan. They smeared the reputation of God's truth. And these people were her greatest enemies and have done what they could by slander, lies, trying to destroy her influence and her character. But in spite of all that, God protected her in a remarkable manner from all harm, raised up benefactors for her wherever she goes, and in spite of the evil intention of some of these fall away believers and through their evil influence, there were even a number of warrants and arrests for Ellen. But God protected her. Just to give you an example, at one instant when a sheriff and a number of his men tried to arrest her, they could move her. Although they exert all their bodily strength for an hour and a half, they couldn't move her. They had no strength to move her. Even though Alan herself or, and, and also no one else around her were making any resistance. And this is what Otis Nicole wrote also later on. He said, Sister Alan has been a resident of my family much of the time for about eight months. I have never seen the least impropriety of conduct in her since our first acquaintance. God has blessed our family abundantly with spiritual things as well as temporal since we received her into our family. The Spirit of God is with her and has been in a remarkable manner in healing the sick through the answer of her prayers. Some cases are as remarkable as any that are recorded in the New Testament. Next week, I will continue. Happy Sabbath. <music>